Um, we, we did a study in 2000. Steve Koslin at Harvard was sort of skeptical about hypnosis, and he said, you know, I think you can just shut your brain down. That's all you're doing with pain. I want a situation in which you have to keep paying attention to do the task, and let's see if hypnotizable people can do it. So what we did was he was very interested in visual imagery, so we identified color processing regions in the brain using PET here, and uh, then we exposed these high hypnotizables to color grids, and one hypnotic task was to drain the color out of them, and another task was to add color to the black and white grid. So they kind of did um, what you are seeing here, draining color from the color grid, adding color to the black and white grid. And what we found was that in hypnosis, but not outside of hypnosis, if they added color to the color grid, they increased blood flow in the color processing regions of the brain. And if they drained color from the color grid, saw it as black and white, which they experienced, they had decreased blood flow. So I call that my believing is seeing experiment. And one crucial thing about hypnotic perceptual alteration, it's not simply a matter of later on reinterpreting what's happening. You actually change your perception. We have an amazing ability in our brains to alter not just how we react to perceptions, but what it is that we perceive. And there are tremendous uses of that in many aspects of medical care. Um, this was an early study we did using event-related potentials. We took 10 high hypnotizable subjects. The red line is their normal evoked response to a series of shocks administered to the wrist. The yellow line, they're getting the same shocks, but they're told your hand is in ice water, it's cool and numb. And you see the P300 is about half as big. That's not too surprising. The P3 is, is bigger when you have a task that's related to the perception of the stimulus or it's a surprising stimulus. But you see that the P100 disappears. That's a tenth of a second after these shocks are administered. That means the brain is just not perceiving those shocks. And so you see a tremendous difference in hypnosis in the ability to alter not just how you react to a perception, but what you perceive. Uh, now, this is work that uh, Dr. Bushnell was crucial in doing, uh, and this is one of the coolest set of studies I've seen related to hypnosis. What they did was um, had put people who were administered shocks in the scanner, and they were given two different kinds of hypnotic analgesia instructions. In one, they were told your hand is cool, tingling, and numb, like we did in the ERP experiment, um, and you will feel uh, it'll filter the hurt out of the pain. And what you, they got was analgesia there, but the action was in somatosensory cortex, and that's one. So the contralateral somatosensory cortex, that's where you saw the reduction in activity. They did the same thing in another experiment, only what they said was, the pain is there, but it won't bother you, which is the way people often experience opiate analgesia. And there they got analgesia, but now the action was not in somatosensory cortex, it was turning down the anterior cingulate gyrus. So just changing the words you use changed the part of the brain that gave you the analgesia. And so when we talk about the sensitivity that hypnotizable people have to their words, to words, this is an exquisite example of that, where just changing what you say changes the part of the brain that provides analgesia. So you can see transformation in hypnosis through primary sensory association cortexes, attentional systems like the ACC, the, the role of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and other dopaminergic pathways. Uh, and so we think the cingulate cortex is a crucial region in modulating uh, hypnotic activity, particularly with its connectivity to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex.